So a few years ago, uh, my church did an adult Sunday school series on the Book of Lamentations. Um, it was powerful. Uh, it was taught by a good friend of mine. Um, but what stuck with me the most about that um, was the fact that this book is scripture. And I sat there listening to the Sunday school thinking, how do you read some of these complaints against God from the pulpit and then say, as we do in my church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like, what does that even mean? Um, I was really gripped by this. Um, I made Lamentations my Lent reading for that year, and I worked through a commentary on it, and then it became a research interest. Um, and it turns out I'm not the only one who's interested in it. Uh, the idea that lament and protest might have a valuable place in Christian liturgy and practice has lately become a topic of increasing theological and philosophical interest. Some have pointed to the role that lament can play in both public worship and private prayer in expressing and encouraging hope in God in the face of suffering. Others have argued that lament teaches us to resist inappropriate uses of power. It teaches us to face rather than deny suffering in our own lives and the world around us. Still others have argued that lament and protest can both empower and help to heal survivors of various kinds of abuse and other traumatic experiences. The inclusion in Holy Scripture of numerous psalms of lament, together with the books of Job and Lamentations, uh, that are chock full of lament and protest, provides, I think, powerful evidence that God is willing to tolerate lament and protest from human beings, at least in what we might call their pious forms, where the lament and protest are directed to God in faith that God is good and in hope that God will be motivated to respond. Moreover, the fact that so many benefits seemingly accrue to us as a result of engaging in such prayer helps to explain why God might tolerate it. In my book, The Hiddenness of God, however, I went a step further than a lot of people writing on lament and protest have been willing to go. Uh, I argued largely on the strength of my reading of Job and Lamentations that God not only tolerates pious lament and protest, but both authorizes and validates even some instances of impious protest. Protest whose primary and most salient motivation is outright anger despair, or similar affective states in response to the apparent injustice, wrongness, or unlovingness of God's behavior, and which is neither expressive of nor significantly motivated by faith or hope in God's love or goodness. In fact, I even went so far as to suggest that God might sometimes prefer impious protest over more pious modes of religious engagement. I stand by these conclusions, but at least on the surface, they're in tension with important widespread assumptions about worship and prayer that I don't want to give up. In particular, it's hard to see how God can authorize and validate impious protest against God if, as I think, it's always true that everyone ought to worship God. Furthermore, it looks like impious protest might be an instance of what Lauren Winner calls the characteristic deformation of prayer. In this talk, after briefly explaining and defending the idea that God validates impious protest, I will explain these tensions more fully and then explain how to resolve them. So yes, this is me answering objections that I've raised against my own stuff. <laughs> so there you go. But they seem to be uh, important issues. All right, so first section, divine validation of protest. The books of Job and Lamentations are both known for their powerful and piercing complaints against God. Job gives us the cries of a man who is presented by the book's own prologue as innocent, righteous, and afflicted by God for no reason. Lamentations offers a prophet's complaint against God for inflicting suffering upon Israel beyond anything she could sensibly be thought to deserve. Both books undeniably contain expressions of hope and trust in God. In fact, heroic expressions given the broader perspectives of the main speakers in each book. But not all of the complaints against God in these books proceed from a hopeful, faithful frame of mind. In her book, Lamentations and the Tears of the World, this is the book I worked through during Lent one year, 
Kathleen O'Connor argues that one finds in Lamentations at best a wavering, uncertain, and substantially confused expression of hope, one that quickly fades as the book moves into its final despairing chapters. And the speeches of Job draw a very clear picture of a character whose mind wavers in the face of persistent divine silence between hope and trust in God and angry despair. For example, even though Job admonishes his wife with the faithful remark, shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive the bad when she urges him to curse God and die, later speeches read more like angry protest. Witness, for example, Job 7, 11 to 20. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the dragon that you set a guard over me? When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint. Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. So that I would choose strangling and death rather than this body. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone for my days are a breath. What are human beings that you make so much of them, that you set your mind on them, visit them every morning, test them every moment? Will you not look away from me for a while? Let me alone until I swallow my spittle. If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of humanity? Why have you made me your target? Why have I become a burden to you? Some of the speeches, furthermore, include outright accusation. So, Job 30, 16 to 23. And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With violence, he seizes my garment. He grasps me by the collar of my tunic. He has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. I cry to you, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you merely look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it, and you toss me about in the roar of the storm. I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. It's hard to imagine these words being uttered with an attitude remotely resembling steadfast hope or faithful trust in divine goodness. These speeches I've just quoted, then, are examples of what I'm calling impious protest. On the assumption that all scripture is divinely inspired and valuable for spiritual teaching, their inclusion in scripture is deeply puzzling, except on the assumption that God somehow authorizes protests like this. Again, how could a congregation take Job 30, 16 to 23 as the Sunday sermon text, read it aloud from the pulpit, and then say, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, apart from the assumption that God in some sense values and accepts these very words? Passages like these don't read like passages, say, in Genesis, where biblical characters are portrayed as behaving in obviously sinful ways, nor do they even read like historical sketches offered without comment of morally ambiguous behavior. Again, Job is presented as blameless, and a reading on which he is blameless only until he starts to complain against God is strained at best. Lamentation, similarly, is given as the words of a prophet and given that the whole point of the book seems to be to bring the prophet's sometimes impious complaints to God, a reading on which the book as a whole is both divinely inspired and subject to God's disapproval seems bizarre. So it seems plausible to treat both books as evidence that even impious protest against God is sometimes acceptable, acceptable to God. As I read the book of Job, however, God does more than just accept Job's protest. God validates it. This is not to say that God endorses or agrees with Job's protest. Rather, the idea is simply that God accepts it and recognizes it as a reasonable response to Job's circumstances on the part of someone who loves goodness and justice, but whose understanding of goodness and justice are obstructed by familiar human limitations. I read this validation partly in God's explicit remark at the end of the book to the effect that Job alone among the speakers in the book has spoken rightly of God but also in God's treatment of Job when God finally appears in response to Job's summons. The divine speeches in Job begin with God appearing as a whirlwind before Job, who has previously described himself as a pile of dust and ashes, and accused God of making him ride on the storm and tossing him about. 
God invites Job to brace himself like a man and receive God's questions, questions that seem calculated to impress upon Job an overwhelming portrait of divine power and majesty. Many commentators have read these speeches as a divine smackdown and extended how dare you question the Almighty, designed to silence Job and to rebuke him for the preceding 32 chapters of complaint and protest. But the speech is climax with God asking who can stand before the mighty Leviathan and be safe, the implied answer being only God. And of course, the obvious and irresistible continuation of that thought is, and so, who can stand before God and be safe? Yet Job, the pile of dust and ashes, does stand safely intact before the divine whirlwind. Think about that. A, a pile of dust and ashes intact in the presence of a whirlwind. Job spends 32 chapters demanding an audience with God and accusing God of treating him with cruelty and undeserved violence. And as I've already noted, at least some of Job's protests are of the impious sort, motivated by and expressive of emotions more like anger and despair than hope and faith. But when God finally appears, God lifts Job up, invites him to stand before God like a man, demonstrates that even in the face of God's overwhelming power, Job can stand and remain safe, and then concludes by restoring Job's material blessings to the extent that they can be restored, and saying that Job has spoken rightly of God. To my mind, it's hard not to read this as God validating Job's protest in the sense that I've described. I believe that on the assumption that scripture is divinely inspired and the formation of the canon was providentially orchestrated, the inclusion of Job in scripture provides powerful evidence that God not only accepts but validates human protest, both pious and impious. But it's hardly the only such evidence. The inclusion of lamentations in the canon provides similar evidence, as do the various Old Testament stories wherein people argue with God, wrestle with God, and time after time receive loving accommodation from God rather than rebuke. And yet, theologically speaking, the view that protest is validated by God faces at least two important challenges. These I take up in the next section. So the duty to worship and the deformation of prayer. The first challenge is that impious protest looks to be inconsistent with our absolute duty to worship God. And so it's hard to see how it can possibly be authorized or validated by God. That we do have a duty to worship God is both plausible and widely endorsed. St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, maintains that human beings owe God worship. Nicholas Wolterstorff, um, a Christian philosopher, identifies an explicit affirmation of the duty to worship in the Episcopal Church's great thanksgiving prayer, which speaks of thanksgiving to God as our bounden duty. And he finds implicit affirmations of the duty to worship in passages of scripture like Psalm 96 that enjoin us to worship God and do particular things like ascribe to the Lord glory and strength that typically count as worship. Commenting on Psalm 96 in particular, Walter Storff says, it's too weak to say that it is a good and joyful thing for the church to assemble to enact the liturgy in worship of God. Assembling to enact the liturgy is something the church ought to do. It is its bounden duty. Should it fail to do so, it would be guilty of wrongdoing. This claim, furthermore, is made against the backdrop of his book's first chapter, the conclusions of which he partially sums up as follows. Worship is a particular mode of Godward acknowledgement of God's unsurpassable excellence. Specifically, a person is worshiping God if her attitudinal stance is that of adoration. Christian adoration of God is awed, reverential, and grateful adoration of God. So it looks as if on Walter Storff's view, the proper aim of Christian liturgy is worship, and the church's duty to enact the liturgy for the worship of God comprises a duty to maintain and express a certain kind of positive attitudinal stance toward God. This is not to suggest that the church or any individual person has a duty to maintain conscious positive attitudes toward God at every moment. So as if sleeping or intensely focusing on something would be a violation of the duty. Rather, I take it that the idea is that the church has a duty to provide regular opportunities for the cultivation and expression of worshipful attitudes, 
And individuals have a duty to integrate the maintenance and expression of attitudes like this into their lives in increasingly deep and meaningful ways. And all parties have a duty to refrain from cultivating or expressing attitudes toward God that are incompatible with the sorts of positive attitudes that Wolterstorff describes. Conceived of in something like this way, fulfilling the duty to worship God is straightforwardly inconsistent with what I'm calling impious protest. The second challenge, that impious protest seems to be a deformation of the practice of prayer, is just a bit more complicated to explain. In The Dangers of Christian Practice, uh, Lauren Winner argues that all Christian practices, like all human practices maybe, are susceptible to characteristic deformations, kinds of damage that are proper rather than merely incidental to the practices. She explains this idea by way of examples. One way for a novel to be damaged is to be overly sentimental. Another way for a no novel to be damaged is for some of its sentences to manifest the poor writing style of a busybody copy editor. The first form of damage is, according to Winner, proper to the art of novel writing. The second is not. Similarly, one way for a family meal to go awry is for a squabble about politics to break out. Another way for a family meal to go awry is for it to be interrupted by an intruder. The first is a form of damage proper to the practice of family meals. The second is not, and so on. Can we say in a more general and precise way what it is for a form of damage to be proper to a practice? Winner doesn't try to do this, nor importantly does she specify exactly what she means by a practice. Is drinking coffee a practice? Drinking coffee with friends? being part of a coffee clatch. It's hard to know where to draw the lines. That said, however, I think that reflection on her illustrative examples points to the following rough account of what it is for a form of damage to be proper to a practice. So let's say that a practice is any type of activity about which it makes sense to say the activity has been done intrinsically well or badly by those who are participating in it that it's not inherently bad when it goes well, and in relation to which we can identify behavioral dispositions, we'll call them virtues associated with the practice, whose manifestation by practitioners of the practice tend to contribute to its going well. The first two conditions you need in order for the notion of damage even to make sense. It's hard to see what sense it would make to say that, for example, someone's aimless stroll through the forest was damaged, if, as I think, the very activity of aimlessly wandering can't be evaluated as having gone well or poorly. I mean, having a heart attack while aimlessly wandering or finding a pot of gold, like those are bad or great, respectively, um, but those are not intrinsic to the stroll. And it makes sense only as a kind of joke to tell someone that they've you know, done a good job or done a poor job of aimlessly wandering. Similarly, it's hard to see what one would even be saying if one applied the notion of damage to an instance of armed robbery or murder. Something has gone undeniably well if a murder is foiled, and that's because the practice of murder is inherently bad. With practices characterized this way, it seems to me that Winner's notion of damage proper to a practice can be adequately captured like this. A form of damage is proper to a practice just if it tends to arise only out of practitioner's failure to manifest some virtue associated with the practice and furthermore contributes to the practice not going well. Sentimentality in a novel tends to arise out of the novelist's failure to manifest virtues associated with novel writing. Bad style introduced by a copy editor does not arise like that. A family dinner erupting in a political squabble tends to arise out of one or more family members failing to manifest virtues associated with the practice of family dinners. Maybe someone had too many margaritas. And intruders disrupting the family dinner typically doesn't arise like that. There are no intrinsic virtues associated with the activity of wandering aimlessly, and this is at least part of why a winner's notion of damage cannot be applied to it, and so on. With this characterization in hand, it's now easy to see how impious protest against God can look like a form of damage proper to the practice of prayer. As it's typically conceived, when prayer goes well, it's worshipful, 
draws one closer to God and includes at least one of the familiar four components, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, or supplication. It's not immediately obvious exactly what virtues contribute to prayer going well, closing your eyes, bowing your head. But a natural thought is that among them would be both a disposition to submit to God and a disposition to interpret God and God's actions in a positive light. So in a way consistent with continued adoration of and thanksgiving toward God. But of course, impious protest against God is a manifestation of neither of those dispositions. And on the typical conception of what it is for prayer to go well, it's natural to think that a prayer that includes impious protest is one that precisely because of the failure of virtue that such a prayer would manifest has not gone entirely well. So what can we say about these two problems? Well, consider again the trilemma that constitutes the first problem. Our concept of God needs to be adjusted. Our concept of worship needs to be adjusted. Or we need to reject the idea that God authorizes and validates impious protest. I have no interest in developing a revisionary concept of God. And I've already made clear my commitment to the idea that God authorizes and validates impious protest. So I think the problem lies in our concept of worship. In contrast to what Wolterstorff argues, I think worship of God is best understood mainly in terms of concepts like fidelity and devotion, rather than in terms of concepts that entail positive attitudes. In the next section, I will unpack this idea in some detail. And what I have to say on that score will, in turn, point the way toward addressing the problem of protest as a kind of defective prayer. Anger, worship, and prayer. I want to begin by raising the question whether anger might ever be an apt or fitting and morally permissible response to God or God's actions. Obviously, lament and protest against God don't always involve anger, but impious protest in particular does often involve that emotion. And I think it's anger's common involvement in impious protest that makes it hardest to see how God could authorize or validate it. So I think that if it can be shown that and why anger toward God can be apt, validated by God, and consistent with worship of God, then the first of the two concerns I'm focusing on in this talk is effectively diffused. So again, can anger ever be an apt response to God? Initially, you might think not. Many philosophers doubt that anger is ever an apt response to anything. And even if we concede that anger is sometimes at least fitting, it's commonly thought to have generally harmful effects. Moreover, many philosophers, both historical and contemporary, think there's an intimate connection between anger and the desire to harm or take revenge. Moreover, anger is often thought to impair one's capacity to reason and in both public and private discourse to polarize its targets against one's own position. Against these claims, though, some philosophers have argued that anger is not inevitably counterproductive and often has positive effects. And a lot of, the, a lot of this is coming out in the literature in feminist philosophy. So for example, commenting on feminist defenses of the value of anger, McAllister Bell writes, Feminist philosophers have argued that anger is a mode of protest that can help maintain agent self-respect, that anger has important roles to play in correct moral perception, and that it allows us to bear witness to injustice, and that it can directly motivate social change. But even if anger is sometimes fitting, non-harmful, and even productive, this doesn't guarantee that anger toward God can ever be apt. To the extent that human anger plays a role in correct moral perception and can motivate us toward positive social behavior, a case can be made that God might have good reason to tolerate it, even when it's directed toward God. But this falls short of establishing its aptness. Nor does it provide reason to think that God might validate such anger. For even if we grant that anger toward God is sometimes permissible, it might still not be fitting. To see why, consider Amiya Srinivasan's views about anger. Srinivasan takes anger to be an evaluative, affective response to moral wrongness, injustice, or maybe other norm violations. She thinks it's often apt, but only in the presence of actual norm violations, rather than merely perceived, even justifiably perceived ones. 
If she's right, and if God is morally perfect, then anger toward God would never be fitting, even if it might sometimes be understandable. And so it could never be validated by God. So what can be said in defense of the fittingness of anger toward God and in support of the claim that God might validate such anger? My answer comes in three steps. The first is to follow Srinivasan in rejecting the idea that anger always involves the desire to harm or take revenge. As she notes, even if ancient cultures had trouble separating anger from the desire to harm or take revenge, anger in contemporary Western culture often occurs unaccompanied by such desires. We might want someone to suffer in the way that you do when you understand the hurt that you've caused, but that's different from the desire to harm the person or to take revenge upon them. The next step is to highlight some of what's intrinsically good about certain kinds of anger, in particular, anger that arises in response to injustice and other kinds of wrongdoing. McAllister Bell, for example, argues that appropriate anger is a mode of hating or being against evil. She goes on to argue that as a response to wrongdoing, anger is not merely understandable, tolerable, or permissible. Rather, it is an excellent response because it does the best job of fitting the failure and expressing the victim's integrity, respect for the object of her anger, and commitment to the moral standards in question. Amiya Srinivasan similarly defends the intrinsic value of anger as a response in certain circumstances, and she's particularly interested in showing that even counterproductive anger might be apt. On her view, the value of anger lies in the fact that it is a means of affectively registering or appreciating the injustice of the world. Her idea is that our capacity for anger is sort of like our capacity for aesthetic appreciation, right? If you look at a beautiful work of art and are just left flat, uh, you may not be violating duties, but like something's broken, right? And so likewise, if you look at a grave injustice, and you recognize that it's wrong, but you have no affective response, well, you may not be violating any duties, but it sure looks like something might be broken. Like there's something good about caring in a way that generates an affective response when you find yourself in the presence of injustice or serious wrongdoing. So these ideas comprise the bulk of Srinivasan's positive defense of the aptness of anger. And I think that together with Bell's remarks on behalf of the value of anger as a mode of standing for what's good and hating what's evil, the defense is compelling. Obviously, not every expression of anger will manifest goods like this, but some do. And the goods that Bell and Srinivasan point to are genuinely significant. There's something deeply important about having an affective response as opposed to a dispassionate response to injustice. Again, though, we have to ask whether anger is apt only in response to actual wrongdoing or whether it might also be apt in response to merely apparent wrongdoing. Here's where I part ways from Srinivasan. And the support I offer for the departure is the third step in my defense of the claim that anger toward God might sometimes be both fitting and validated by God. Srinivasan defends the claim that anger is apt only in response to actual norm violations just by way of this example. She says, what if I mistakenly but justifiably believed that you're not coming to the party was a moral violation? I'm inclined to say that my anger would be excused but inapt. If I learned that you in fact had made no promise to come to the party, I would hardly insist that my previous anger about your non-attendance was fitting. But I think that example doesn't really support her point. The reason is that our present judgments about past anger are easily influenced by our present grasp of the circumstances. When you know now that your past anger was based on a mistake, there's a lot of pressure to just say, well, yeah, I shouldn't have been angry. Change the example to get rid of the distortion, put it all in the present tense, and I think things look a lot different. So suppose it now seems to you on the basis of evidence you can't explain by other means that your business partner has embezzled a large sum of money from your business. You are naturally angry. Is your anger apt? Well, I think it is, but the more important point is that whether it is or not, the answer doesn't really depend on whether you correctly believe that your partner embezzled the money. Right? You've got the evidence. It sure looks to you like they embezzled the money, and that seems sufficient to ground the aptness of your anger. 
Notice, too, that in constructing this example, I haven't said that you actually believe or you believe that you've been betrayed or that you even have justifying evidence that you've been betrayed. You have evidence that seems to you to be compelling, and it seems to you that you've been betrayed, but seemings are different from beliefs, right? Seemings are sort of cognitive inclinations to believe or a kind of cognitive pressure to believe. And it seems to me that anger in response to seemings that don't rise to the level of belief, that can be apt too. When you're confronted with a logical paradox, I mean, the paradox works because all the premises seem to be true, even though you know, you absolutely know that not all of them can be true, right? And, you know, if it seems to you, that's why I have these pictures up here, if it seems to you that your child is in grave danger, um, if it just seems that way, what, regardless of whether you've, you know, considered it to the level of actually forming the belief, regardless of whether you have justifying evidence, even if upon reflection you would think, yeah, maybe I don't really have good evidence. If it seems to you that your child is in grave danger, it makes sense to be gravely concerned. It would be weird not to be. And if it seems to you that your child is in grave danger as a result of the neglect of a caregiver, it makes sense to be angry. It, there too, it might even be weird not to be. In light of all this, I think it's clear that anger toward a morally perfect God might sometimes be fitting. Much of what God permits in the world and some of what God is said to have done in the world powerfully seems to fallible human beings to be inconsistent with perfect love and goodness. And in light of all else that I've said in this talk, it seems fitting for those who believe in God and love goodness and justice and their fellow human beings to respond with anger. Job and the prophet of Lamentations are two biblical figures who seem to have been fittingly angry with God, even if, as both I and the tradition would affirm, God did not, in fact, act wrongly on the occasions that provoked their anger. If this is right, then anger toward God is sometimes apt. Insofar as such anger is a mode of loving what is good and hating what is evil, and insofar as it aligns a, person's, a person with God's values, even if not God's own perception of the circumstances, it seems furthermore that such anger will be validated by God. Again, not endorsed as a correct response to the circumstances, but recognized as a reasonable response on the part of someone who loves what is good and is taking a stand for it insofar as they have a grasp on it. The question now is whether expressing apt anger toward God is compatible with worship. I take it that even if it's possible to maintain and express an attitude of odd admiration for someone while in the grip of apt anger against them, this is at best extremely difficult and uncommon. But why characterize worship in terms of odd admiration? True, odd admiration often, maybe even typically, at least accompanies paradigmatic acts and attitudes of worship. But so, do, so too do a cluster of other acts, attitudes, and dispositions, several of which seem to me to be better candidates than odd admiration for capturing the essence of worship. It is, for example, natural to identify worship with a kind of love or devotion. It's also natural to identify worship with a kind of honoring. Honoring is at least in the same conceptual family as odd admiration, but importantly, it seems entirely possible to honor someone in thought, word, and deed, while at the same time being angry with them and expressing that anger. It would be surprising, for example, if the command to honor your parents were inconsistent with your being angry with them or expressing your anger to them. And of course, it's obviously possible to be angry with and express anger toward those whom we love or bear other forms of intense and stable devotion. Now, it's not my task here to provide a definitive analysis of worship, but what I'm recommending as a way of diffusing the first of the two problems that I've identified is to construe our absolute duty to worship God, not as a duty to maintain a certain attitudinal stance, but rather a duty to maintain, cultivate, and express a complex dispositional stance. What I have in mind is something more like love, devotion, allegiance, honoring, or some combination of these rather than mere attitudes like odd admiration. 
Construing worship like this makes room for the possibility of negative, evaluative, affective responses to God without violating the duty to worship. A further advantage is that unlike admiration and other affective, evaluative responses like anger, stances, like dispos stances or dispositions like love, devotion, and the like are plausibly within our voluntary control. Accordingly, those, unlike the attitudes, are more appropriately thought to be among our obligations and duties. If all of this is right, then there's no very compelling reason after all to think that impious protest is inconsistent with our duty to worship God. So there's nothing problematic about the assumption that God authorizes it. Neither is there anything problematic about the supposition that God validates it. The apparently impious protest against God that we find in Job seems to be at least partly motivated by and expressive of respect for God's law and love of justice and the good. And the protest we find in Lamentations seems to be at least partly motivated by and expressive of a concern for justice and compassion for, toward others. To be sure, if God is morally perfect, these protests reflect confusion on the part of the protester but insofar as they arise out of the good attitudes just noted, these protests, though impious, still locate the protesters among God's staunch allies. They are confusedly expressive of allegiance to God and devotion to things that God loves. They may, in their own way, even constitute confused expressions of love for and devotion to God. It's easy, I think, to imagine God validating and indeed valuing such protest. It's even easy to imagine God preferring such protest over other modes of engagement, given the protesters' inaccurate grasp of the circumstances. I've diffused the first challenge to the idea that God authorizes and validates impious protest by arguing that such protest is not inconsistent with our duty to worship God, and may in fact both arise out of and express deep allegiance to and devotion to God. With this response in hand, we can now diffuse the second challenge, the concern that impious protest appears to be a damaged form of prayer. Recall that the second challenge boiled down to this. As is typically conceived, when prayer goes well, it is worshipful, it draws one closer to God, and it includes at least one of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Plausibly, too, well-formed prayer is accompanied by a disposition to submit to God and to interpret God's actions in a positive light, but impious protest seems to be prayer that manifests none of these characteristics, so it's broken prayer. Well, the first thing to note by way of response is that if the arguments of the previous section are sound, impious protest is consistent with a worshipful, worshipful stance toward God, even if it is not itself expressive of worship. Moreover, on the traditional assumption that God is good, loving, compassionate, merciful, a lover of justice, particularly for the oppressed, and that God is all of these things to a far greater degree than any human might be, it seems that much of what was highlighted as beneficial about the manifestation and expression of apt anger would ultimately draw a person closer to God, even when one's anger is directed and expressed toward God. Indeed, for some people, the path toward recovering their conception of God as an ally in the struggle against injustice and as a protector of their own best interests and the best interests of others might well involve a great deal of prayer wherein they bear affective witness to injustice before God, angrily reminding God of what human beings need, what mercy, compassion, and justice require, and what love, as it's humanly conceived anyway, necessarily involves. With regard to just those first two components, then, impious protest may well be highly functional prayer, at least for a person in certain kinds of circumstances. Once we see this, however, then we have to ask whether the remaining components of paradigmatically well-functioning prayer are in fact necessary for prayer to go well, or just typical of well-functioning prayer in ordinary circumstances. I would submit that they're just typical. Just as love, devotion, honor, allegiance, and so worship in ordinary circumstances are paradigmatically positive and full of praise and admiration, so too prayer would be. And so likewise, prayer would naturally be accompanied by a disposition to interpret God positively and to submit to God's desires. 
But impious protest on the part of a still worshipful believer arises out of extreme and unusual circumstances. And I think it's ultimately better to say that impious protest is one form of prayer that is still functioning well in such circumstances, rather than to say that it's prayer that has been broken in part by the circumstances in which it occurs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we are called to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But at the same time, perfect love casts out fear. Like so many ideas in scripture, these ideas need to be held and understood in tension with one another. Neither trumps the other. It is in part the first cluster of ideas that makes impious protest seem so far out of bounds. But I think one way, maybe the only way in which the love of a fearsome person who surpasses their beloved along every conceivable positive dimension can cast out fear is by that person showing themselves to be receptive and meekly responsive to the worst the beloved has to offer. This is how it goes on the cross. And I think this is part of what's going on in the divine authorization and validation of protest. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so the question is, does it follow from the talk that it's always apt to be angry with God? Um, and, and then the, the continuation of the thought is like, um, you know, sometimes we have so much anger that maybe we, maybe we get to the point where we think, yeah, it's just not apt. Right. Um, yeah. 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 The, the anger gets too broad in scope. Um, so I guess there's there's a few things I want to say. So one, I, although I realize this isn't exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, like I want to emphasize there's there's nothing in my talk that suggests that. Um, anger is a mandatory response to God, nor is there anything that suggests that just any kind of anger toward God is apt, right? So like a nice scriptural example is Jonah's anger at the end of the book of Jonah. Jonah is asked to prophesy to, um, oh, if it was it Babylon or Assyria? He's asked to prophesy someplace where they're doing bad things and to tell them that unless they repent, they're gonna be destroyed. They hear Jonah, they repent. And so God relents and Jonah walks outside the city and just like, <laughs> Why? <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to come here because I knew you wouldn't destroy them. I knew you'd relent if they repented. And Jonah's upset. And God seems really not to validate that. Although, interestingly, God does do some things to, give, to show tender concern for Jonah and also to kind of gently slap him around a little bit. Um, so, I, so yeah, I don't want to commit to that. But... Um, but I, I mean, your thought, I think, is more like there's so much bad stuff going on in the world and so much stuff about which it makes sense to be angry. And given that God is in charge of the world, it's going to make sense on what I'm saying to be angry with God. And so isn't just constant anger toward God about pretty much everything bad going on in the world. Isn't that always going to be apt? Um, and I guess I want to say... Yes-ish, right? <laughs> yes, yes, if I lean heavily on what aptness really is. It fits and it's morally permissible, right? Um, to say that it's apt isn't, again, it's not to say that it's mandatory, it's not even to say that it's healthy, that it's good for you, it's not even to say um, that it's not also true that you should do what you can to move beyond it, right? If you had an abusive upbringing, for example, which I'm, I'm just certain, given statistics, that a good chunk of you did, right? Um, I wanna say it's apt to be angry about that at any given time. Um, but that does not at all mean that you will have an emotionally healthy life if you are angry about that all the time. It's not to say that God doesn't also want you at some point to move beyond it. Um, but it's something that fits. And I guess I think, you know, in response to an abusive upbringing at any given time, it's morally permissible to have an affective evaluative response of anger. 
I, I'm not even sure that we can help it exactly, uh, except by, you know, just kind of working through it, enduring the anger when it comes, and that sort of thing. So in that sense, yeah, I want to say even your generalized anger at everybody in response to those circumstances, it was apt, but as you rightly saw, not great for you and something that was worth moving beyond. And, and I think all of that fits in with what I'm saying here. Yeah, so one, so one question, uh, let's make sure I'm getting this. Um, one, one question is, um, how does what I'm saying fit with the injunction to consider it all joy when we undergo various trials? Another question is, um, how does what I'm saying fit with the idea that we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, given that it's kind of hard to bear our friend's burdens while indulging our own anger toward God? Right. Um, so first question first. So again, I don't, I don't want to say that just anything you might be, you might be angry over is fine. Um, and there is a real difference between being angry at what you yourself are suffering, angry about what you yourself are suffering, and being anger, angry about you know, the injustices that others suffer and things like that. Uh, that's not to say I don't think you can be angry about what you yourself suffer, but it is worth noting that difference. But I, I guess I think the, you know, it often happens that we have um, options for how we look at a situation and that more than one of the options is permissible and you know, rationally intelligible and things like that. And I think, you know, especially with sufferings that we ourselves are undergoing and especially with sufferings that we're undergoing for a good cause, like for the sake of the gospel, we do have options. We can uh, be indignant at the unjust treatment of the people who are just behaving so unreasonably, or we can shift our focus and be grateful that like, wow, like my ministry must be having an effect because some people are really upset about this, right? Um, and I, I take Paul to be urging us to take the other view. I take something like this to be the point of the, you know, go the extra mile, turn the other cheek sorts of passages, right? Um, they're, they're not... As I read them, they're not urging like unqualified submission to abuse, you know, or anything like that. Um, they're urging in cases where it's certainly possible to take a different outlook, right? But, that, but that's not to say that it wouldn't be permissible also to just like be angry at this Roman who was coming and making you, you know, carry his backpack, you know, or something like that, right? Um, but in some ways, it just goes better for you if, if you're able to take the other perspective. Um, uh, you know, in Paul's own life, right, often enough, he was put in prison and subject to unjust treatment and considered it joy. But notably, at a certain point, they were arresting him and putting him in prison. And he said, look, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do that. I want to go before a court, right? And it, you don't really get Paul getting angry, but like I, I take that to be like there's a case where he could have considered it all joy too, but for whatever reason he chose the other option. And I, don't, I don't think he acted wrongly there. Um, you know, there are interesting commentators have interesting questions about whether he acted productively and stuff, but you know, that's a kind of scriptural instance. As for bearing one another's burdens, I think there's. Um, First of all, there's a difference between having the anger and sort of being preoccupied with it. Um, but second of all, and I think uh, importantly, um, I mean, depending on the burden, um, having an empathetic response is a way of bearing another's burden. And it might well be, it might well issue in anger. Uh, and the anger might spill over into anger toward God. And yeah, you're right. You're not going to be helpful if you become so consumed with your own anger that you stop supporting your friend and start like yelling at them like, why, why would God let this happen? You know, and so like I've seen that kind of thing happen and that's not supportive. Um, but um, 
But if the anger wells up in you at the re- because you love your friend and you're, sh- you're empathizing and sharing their burden, yeah, that does seem apt. You just also have to, you know, it's just <laughs> good working with others, right? You just have to keep in perspective that, you know, you're supposed to be supportive here. You can get some distance from it and blah, blah, blah. And nothing, nothing in this talk is meant to counteract that kind of commonsensical thought. In my talk, God simply validates our anger. But like, here's another possibility. We have this anger. We see it welling up inside us, and we hand it over to God, and then as a result, we're delivered from it. And isn't that like at least good, and maybe isn't that better in some way? Is that sort of the idea? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that is better. <laughs> um, and I think that if God... Uh, I think that if, you know, if God could just sort of, um, well, God could do whatever God wants. Um, God, God lets us make choices and have responses. How all that fits in with providence, I, you know, I'm not going to try to get into that. But um, I guess I think, like, if you ask God, what would you rather me do? Just stew in my anger for a while or do this hand it over to you kind of thing? I think God would say, well, hand it over to me. That's... But it would be because God knows that's going to work out better for us. What, what I'm urging here is that um, for people who aren't there, and there are plenty of people who aren't there, the right both pastoral and philosophical response to them isn't, look, get over that as soon as you can because this is intolerable to God. You have no right to be angry with God. God's perfect. This is not fitting. That's not the right response. What I'm urging is that the right philosophical and pastoral response is, yeah, if that's where you're at, that's okay. God validates that. Look in scripture. God, people express their anger to God all the time. Bring it to God. Express it to God. Pray about it in an angry way, in an honest way. And you're not violating your duty to worship, uh, or at least not necessarily. Um, and this is the kind of thing God will validate. It's, it, it is saying that God meets certain people where they're at and doesn't demand something different. But it's, it's not at all meant to suggest that there's no better response for them or that God... Um, prefers anger over all other choices. I, I think God probably, who am I to speak for God, right? But as I read the scriptures, I imagine God preferring someone who protests angrily against injustice to someone who uh, simply stuffs it down because they're afraid uh, to give an impious response. I, there's an example, a friend of mine um, the philosophers in here know him. It's Mark Murphy. Um, maybe I shouldn't reveal his name, but I've done it on several videos now, so I'll just go ahead. Um, he tells this anecdote about his kids that I have found compelling for all the time that I've been working on this stuff. Apparently, uh, I mean, I'm probably getting some of the details wrong, but apparently Mark was you know, roughhousing with one of the kids, and it looked to the two- or three-year-old like he was actually hurting the older kid. And the two or three year old looked at Mark angrily and shouted, not my brother, and ran up and kicked Mark in the shins, right? And you look at that and you just think, like it would be totally dysfunctional to be like, child, do not kick your parent, you know, and to get all, like that is such a beautiful response on the part of a child who is gonna take on his powerful dad in defense of his brother out of love for his brother, right? Like that's just, the kid is confused, obviously. Mark wasn't hurting the brother at all. Um, But man, I would much rather have one of my kids do that than sit there and say, well, good thing dad's really damaging, (laughs) you know, my sibling, or to be like, I, you know, I can't respond to dad. This looks bad, but can't can't do anything, you know, like, that's a great response, right? Um, Maybe, you know, in that circumstance, there's probably all kinds of responses that would be even better that wouldn't involve shin kicking, right? But but still, the shin kicking was good, 
And, and that's kind of, that's one of the underlying thoughts here. Can we thank our speaker and I hope you all have Thanks for coming.